without further ado, I will hand it over to our partners at, at Natively and Popular Pays, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be talking on this conference call. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jenny um, Brish from Popular Pays, the CRO, quickly. Uh, but just wanted to kind of give a quick introduction. Um, I'm the president of Natively. Uh, and what we specialize in doing is connecting brands with up and coming, um, you know, I guess you could call them startups, but actually the, what it really is are solutions to help grow their businesses. Um, so we'll act as evangelists on behalf of our startup partners and sort of introduce them to these new solutions like we've done for companies like Waze, uh, platforms like Waze or Nextdoor, or publishers like Bill Simmons The Ringer. Um, I think it's no secret that the influencer space is one of the hottest sort of, you know, parts of the marketing mix right now. Um, it's something we've been watching for a while. I, you know, I think it, it has a lot of the same DNA that we saw with the rise of the blogosphere and sort of the influential bloggers. But because of the growth of Instagram um, and just the power behind that, I think it's like that, but on steroids. Um, you know, I think from a macro perspective, we're on slide two right now. You know, you're seeing that. You know, 49% of people actually rely on Instagram for purchase decisions. Um, and the RI shows as well with, you know, a return of 650 for every dollar spent. Um, so we're not only seeing an incredible sort of awareness play by leveraging Instagram influencers. We're also seeing ROI as well as the ability to block things like ad blocking, which, you know, especially if you're sort of a younger target and more technologically technologically savvy, you're probably implementing. So, you know, by leveraging influencers, you can sort of bypass people that have may have taken, you know, ad blocking on their, their desktop or their phones. Um, so in short, you know, at Natively, we saw a massive opportunity here for both brands um, and influencers to partner. Um, but, you know, it's still early days in, in, this, in this sort of part of marketing. And there's a lot of, you know, inefficiencies still. So when we were looking at startups to partner with, you know, we went far and wide until we sort of connected with Popular Pays, and we found them to be far and away the, the leader, um, not only in terms of their platform, which takes a lot of sort of the pain and hassle out of influencer-oriented programs, which I, I feel are, you know, really the main, main people pain point with, with implementing these things. Um, so from a technolo technology standpoint, they're extremely strong but also an overall knowledge base of how the best way to partner with influencers is. Because it, it seems good to everyone, but there's a lot of nuances that, you know, hopefully we'll cover here in the next 20 minutes. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jenny, who and Alexandra, our very own real-life influencer, um, who are much more savvy than I and entertaining. So we'll, we'll kick it over there. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Uh, after, good afternoon, everybody. As Mark mentioned, we also have Alexander Dawson, who's part of the Poppy's community in New York based nutritionist and wellness expert, um, with um, her, her own blog and also a uh, large presence on Instagram, a community that's really centered around wellness and, and nutrition. So she's going to be tag teaming with me a bit as we go through this presentation just to, to speak into some of the um, different things we put together. It's really a, an overview of influencer marketing kind of starting with the why you would want to work with influencers as an emerging brand. Um, so we can click on to the next slide and talk through a few of the different reasons why brands who are up and coming engage influencers to grow their brand. So one of the biggest reasons, um, pretty straightforward and obvious, is the brand equity, the awareness, and the growth that influencer partnerships can offer, offer you. So you're building trust within your community by leveraging voices that are outside of just your brand voice. You can also look to influencers for credibility. One thing that I wanted Alexandra um, to point out is just a little bit about her background, the different the different level of credibility she brings to brands she partners with. Alexandra, do you want to speak into that real quick? Yeah, definitely. It's so great to meet everyone um, on the phone. I just wanted to quickly add more to this. Um, so an influencer is more than someone that just is posting photos and captions and blog posts online, but someone that's cultivated their audience for a reason. Um, as a nutritionist, I have eight years of education in my belt. I have a background in neuropsychology and nutrition and dietetics. And so it's not just words, but um, the credibility that stands behind it and an audience that's following because they trust my opinion. Thank you. Um, I would say another big reason that we see um, 
upcoming brands tap into influencer partnerships is just creating the awareness for those new product launches. Um, for seasonal initiatives, for events, so influencers can attend events on behalf of brands, um, often building more locally based communities through that. And obviously you can access new potential customers and there are definitely ways to drive conversions through influencer partnerships and we can chat more about that um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, switching over to slide six, the other big reason that a lot of our brands are working with influencers is to build their own channels and their audience. So if you're a newer brand and you're building your, you know, whether it's Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook presence, obviously those kind of partnerships can expand the reach and engagement on your own channels. And they can also bring new audiences into the conversation about your brand. Um, you know, think about expanding your brand outside who you envision it is specifically made for. Um, and look at an influencer partnership that might give you access to you know, new people, new audiences that you wouldn't even expect to be engaged. Um, Alexander had a really great example um, about this when we were chatting earlier in the week during this webinar. Just kind of thinking outside the box of just the, the core audience you think you should be engaging. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, definitely, especially for brands in the wellness space, in the food space, um, it may feel instinctual to partner with a food blogger or someone that is in that um, wellness space specifically. But what you have to remember is that like wellness belongs to everyone, everybody eats. And so maybe, you know, it doesn't feel completely aligned at the beginning, but that audience is an audience that you can still captivate, even though they may not be directly in line with you. Um, there's still ones that may be interested. Um, they're still shopping at the grocery store, walking through the market, and may spot your product. So definitely. Um, and just quickly going on to slide seven. One other way that we see brands working with influencers, and it's not necessarily something that you might think of off the bat, although I'm sure um, some of the companies on this call definitely have already. But a growing need that we have, uh, that brands have, is obviously quality content that's going to power your own brand. And so whether that content is something that you're going to use on your Instagram channel, whether that content is something that you're going to use as an asset for paid spend for an Instagram ad, a Facebook ad, um, you know, another digital placement even outside of social, there's uh, a real, real opportunity here to tap into influencers who are building for social, extremely authentic, high-quality content. Um, obviously, working with influencers helps to reduce the traditional lead times of content um, production. It can also help reduce the cost as well if you're not working with like a full service creative agency. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, you know ways to power power your brand through this content, and it obviously helps to reduce the creative fatigue that can occur um, if you're putting out the same content over and over. Influencers can help really drive variety and authenticity in that content. So if you're looking at influencer programs, just switching on to, to slide eight, a lot of people are asking, well, what can I expect from an influencer program? You know, I'm newer to this, um, or maybe I've tried this and it worked out okay, and or it worked out great and I want to build on that. Like, what really is the impact that I can expect? Um, so switching over onto slide nine, um, one thing we wanted to point out is that obviously you're going to drive a lot of engagement through an influencer partnership. And engagement rates on organic influencer posts um, can range from you know two and a half percent to five percent. And I would pay attention to engagements such as shares and app mentions as well, because those are often attributed to increased engagement on your own channels or sending people to your channel through their posts. So that increases the following on your social channels. Um, if you want to flip, flip ahead to the next slide, Alex turns that'd be um, great. Not sure if it's awesome. Thank you. And then, as well as conversions, is one thing I wanted to point out. So a lot of CPG brands have reported increased traffic to their own um, owned websites when partnering with influencers. You can definitely use clever um, links in captions, in bios. There are social networks that do allow for that click-through to really drive conversions. And as I mentioned earlier, there's an opportunity to leverage the awesome content coming out of these partnerships. And that content has been proven to perform. Uh, really well and oftentimes outforms brand content. Just a real quick uh, study we did last year with Kenmore is that the content that an influencer created for Kenmore, Kenmore actually yielded 106% yielded higher engagement than the content that the internal brand team had generated for um, Kenmore. So it's an interesting thing to, to keep in mind. I'm jumping on to slide 10 as well. I don't want to go through all of these um, in detail, but just some stats to keep in mind. So 
being realistic about um, the things that work and the things that don't um, in influencer marketing. I definitely think it is um, quite obviously uh, pretty easy for for us at this point in time to understand that with the algorithms changing across social, not every single follower is going to see an organic post. But that doesn't mean the post didn't have its impact. Um, the influencer posts give you additional visibility on social. They reduce that creative fatigue from new and existing customers. And they're also proven to boost brand sentiment. And obviously, on other things, you have to find that there's different shelf life, quote unquote, for posts across different networks. So on Instagram, for example, 90% of engagement is seen in the first 10 hours, whereas Pinterest and Facebook post the engagements with a little bit of a longer tail. Just keeping that in mind, the way that you want to kind of flex the content and the strategy across those different networks. If you want to switch to slide 11 as well, so one of the things we always get asked is, what do I consider when deciding which influencers to partner with? Um, and obviously that is definitely not the, um, you know, the most straightforward question to answer, but there's a couple of things that we look at as kind of key metrics. And one of those is, is obviously follower count. Um, but in addition to that, we want to look at engagement. So you want to look at those two kind of in parallel. Um, Alexandra Dawson, I want to, to ping it over to you because I know you have some really great thoughts around how to view engagement more holistically. Yeah, definitely. So when looking at influencers to partner with, um, I know that that follower count can feel really enticing. But um, but follower count aside, and um, I think it's also important to focus on how they're engaging with their community and how their community is engaging back. And so it's not just that number, but the quality of engagements that are happening. Are people liking their posts? Are they commenting on them? Are they leaving more than just an emoji in the comments? And is that you know, driving a real authentic conversation. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's right. No, that's super helpful. Um, yeah. And I mean, overall, we're looking at, no, that totally makes sense. And I think one of the things you had pointed out to when we were chatting earlier in the week is just like, are they actually, you know, is their feed really relevant to your brand? But then also, are those conversations super relevant to your brand? Um, the aesthetic fit is something else I would point out as well. And again, this seems like a bit of a no-brainer, but there have definitely been um, brands who have like very, very certain styles that they want their content to be created in. And there are some brands who say my, you know, my brand kind of can swing across multiple different types of styles. So it's just really important to understand that when you're selecting a creator and say you're evaluating them based on their Instagram feed, the type of content you should expect them to to um, provide it, it's going to be in line with the aesthetic of their feed. So someone who is really a street photographer and kind of has a dark, edgy feed is probably not a fit for, for a brand that wants kind of like light, airy, outdoorsy types of photos. Again, feels like a no-brainer, um, but it's definitely something just to keep in mind is honing in on that aesthetic and does it match and kind of fit with the vibe of your brand. We're looking at slides uh, 13 and 14. Uh, great question. I just want to touch on this real quickly, and I know that everyone's going to have that, the chance to download um, this information after the call. So you can go through it in a little bit better detail, but just touching on a few of the different network options that are out there when we're talking about influencer marketing. So obviously, um, Instagram we put first because we've seen a great value for emerging brands. Um, it is really rooted in high-quality content. It offers a variety of different formats, whether that is, you know, what we're now calling a quote-unquote traditional post or whether that's an Instagram story or a live activation. Uh, really good engagement and just well-curated communities. Um, Facebook, obviously, um, great, huge, old standby network. One of the things that we found is really helpful with Facebook is that it's actually really good for paid spend that's powered by that influencer-generated content that's drilling right into your audience. The organic reach on Facebook can be a bit throttled because of the algorithm. So um, it's best to really put your content to hard work on Facebook um, versus focusing on influencer um, generated posts there. And then obviously Twitter, Pinterest, and Snapchat as well. A lot of um, the brand, brands have asked us recently, you know, what's, you know, should we delve into Snapchat? And um, they actually have found that in looking a bit deeper, they're favoring Instagram for the analytics versus Snapchat. You can actually see how many people are following your story, and you can see views, uh, view information on the story. Obviously, there's an opportunity to um, have a creative conversation in advance and approve content in advance of that post going live, 
Whereas on SNAP, you're rolling the dice a little bit more, um, and you're definitely guaranteed to dig into a, a much younger audience. That's what we're hearing just recently about SNAP. Um, and then Pinterest as well is um, the organic posts there are pretty long life cycles. Pins can really, you know, continue generating engagement and traffic even a year after they're posted. And a lot of that content's rooted in really awesome, high-quality blog posts. One thing to keep in mind there is that the price points are a bit higher because the blog posts require that extra work. And a lot of the influencers on Pinterest um, have been doing this for, you know, 10, 12 years, the same as in the blogosphere. We're looking at, um, we can skip ahead to slide 15. So thinking through how to activate influencers. So really getting down to if I'm if I'm launching a campaign, like what's the best way to work with somebody? So uh, we went through these a little bit already. Um, I'll slide through them pretty quick. But obviously the first and most obvious um, is the organic post. So posting to their own audience, it's obviously going to bring your brand to life in a new way. One thing that brands often forget is that influencers are living on social, so they know the new formats before in-house brand teams before even in-house agency teams are really familiar with them. So a great example was last summer when stories rolled out. We had our brand teams calling us asking if they could work with influencers immediately to kind of understand stories and how can I create a good story for my brand? How should I be developing my, my new quote-unquote story strategy? So it's really great to have ongoing partnerships that can help you access new formats right away and kind of test and learn with, in partnership with the influencers. And the last bit, um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you can actually boost the top performing organic posts on Facebook and Instagram. So if I'm posting as an influencer for my Instagram account and my post is performing really well as a brand, um, as part of my partnership with you, you can actually put paid spend behind my handle. And so it will show up in your feed as coming from at Jenny Rich. And it doesn't really appear as an ad right away, so it's a little bit more thumb stopping. It doesn't look like branded content, um, but obviously it's performing really well organically, and so boosting that into either the same audience that's performing well to organically or your target audience puts a little bit more power um, behind, behind that actual post. And then I want to be cognizant of time so we can get to Q&A, but we can slide through um, the next section pretty quickly. So looking at leveraging the latest features um, on social. So we tried to hone in on a couple of features that are really ROI focused, just knowing that obviously as emerging brands, you know, sales, conversion, um, awareness is all really, really important. So one of the things that we pointed out um, is that Instagram stories by location or hashtag is actually a really um, a, a good way to make your brand or campaign hashtag more searchable. Um, it's having influencers posting those, those stories. And so it's easy to, to go um, and have a location-based activation that can enhance a new product launch, um, or if you have initiatives that are specific geofences, so if your product's only in California, you know, leveraging stories and then um, that location by location or hashtag allows your brand to be pretty searchable. If you're moving on to the next slide, there's shoppable tags on um, products as well. So business pages can now tag featured products and posts that link directly to a uh, shopping page on your website. Right now, Instagram has rolled this out to select business pages, but they're continuing to roll it out um, a little bit more. So I would just keep an eye on that. And you know, the reason that matters, obviously, is it gives you the option to drive click through. And so it's giving you um, a really easy place to, to drive traffic from Instagram, which as we know in the past, hasn't always been a, as straightforward or simple. Lovely little video as well. Um, I'd be curious to know as well if anyone on, on the call has used this yet and you know with any success. Um, we definitely see brands that are starting to dig a lot more into this activation. And the last feature we wanted to point out as well is the Pinterest lens, lens feature. So Pinterest actually has been making a number of changes to really build themselves as a much more search-focused network. Um, this visual search tool actually uses machine vision to detect objects in the real world and suggest related items on the, on, on the service. So if you are posting a pin, um, people can you know, shop the look right off of, right off of Pinterest. So as Pinterest continues to build out more and more um, search-related features, 
it's really important to have original, high-quality content for Pinterest, so it increases your brand searchability and ultimately it increases those conversion rates as well. So before we get to the Q&A, the last slide I want to go through, um, and this is uh, a slide that I wanted Alexander Dawson to lead up as a woman who has been in the influencer space um, for a long time and brings a lot of expertise to a number of the brands um, on this particular call, just wanted to talk through how do you make the most of your influencer partnerships? What's, what's the right way to build a relationship? Um, you know, what are the kind of key tactics to make sure that relationship is successful? So I'm going to ping it over to Alexandra and take it away. Definitely. So making the most of your influencer partnership, um, it's important to build a clear creative brief while also giving an influencer creative liberty so they're able to create in a way that will cultivate and foster their community. Um, by doing this, you're letting an influencer take their own creative direction, um, capture their own voice and photo style, which is something that their communities are familiar with. You want to make sure that when they're creating content and they're sharing content that no one's turned off by it, that it doesn't feel like a billboard or an ad, but like a really authentic piece of material that's going to resonate, which is what everyone wants. And so just making sure that we keep that in mind. Um, engage an influencer with your product. An influencer should feel as impassioned about your product as you do. And what I mean by that, you know, is before you even kick off your relationship, before you even think contract, get your product in their hand, let them try it, make sure they really love it. Because the last thing that you want is someone talking about your product that they don't really love, um, that they're not going to put their everything behind because essentially they're an ambassador for you. Um, they're the man on the floor that's talking about you, and if they get any questions, you want them to answer in a really positive way. You want them to keep sharing that love, um, and yeah, and just having that be. Um, treat influencers like partners and collaborate that with them in a way that you would a teammate. Influencers aren't billboards. You want them on your team, championing, championing, sorry, championing your brand. Um, so what I mean by that is um, sorry. an influencer isn't a billboard. So you want them creating a piece of content that they feel impassioned by, like I said, that they're happy to share with their audience, that's going to resonate with their audience, um, and also a caption that stands behind it. You may feel like you have a, like a brand identity and it's everything that you want, and you want X in a caption and Y in a caption, and this piece of branding in a photo. But what ends up happening with that is that it feels like an advertisement and you're not getting that real authentic experience um, that people stop and look at when they're scrolling through their feeds. It you know, will just blend in with everything else if it feels too branded or too specific. Um, don't restrict yourself to working with one specific type of influencer. You may be surprised at how well a variety of influencers can bring your brand to life. This is something that we mentioned earlier. Um, as um, I just said, you may have the specific brand identity that you're going for, but there, there's always a win in making your audience larger, especially in the food space and the wellness space. Like, even though you may be partnering with people that don't fall in line with that exact mold, everybody eats, everybody needs to move. Um, wellness is something that I think infiltrates into all fields. And so you never know who you're going to capture um, by expanding who you're willing to partner with. Great. Well, thank you both very much. I think that was extremely valuable information and in getting started and, and why it's important to, to work with influencers in, in today's day and age um, through social media. So we received a few questions ahead of time. So Jenny and Alexandra, I'd love it if, um, if we could go through some of these, some of which we, we covered during the presentation, but there seems to be more energy around certain topics that um, I would love to spend a little more time on. Okay, so to get started, um, 
One company asked for actionable advice for execution um, and maintenance of a program once influencers are ready to go. So once you've identified the influencer you want to work with, um, what is the actual next step and then the ongoing relationship? How does that look? Yeah, so I, I think one thing to remember is always having a contract in place. So that's super boring, right? But important to have that to align expectations and agreed upon deliverables. Um, we don't, if we're just speaking from what our platform does, we actually manage that process end to end. So Alexandra's worked with a number of brands on our platform. So if she applies to work for a campaign and that particular brand selects her, then the entire process of being able to message and collaborate creatively to review content together and then actually to capture the post when it goes live is managed through that platform. I think that does give brands a lot of efficiency. If you don't, uh, if you're not using a, you know, a system to manage it, then the first place to start, I think, would be a contract and a timeline. So treating it a little bit um, more like you would traditional, you know, content, content timelines and creative timelines, having that really clear conversation up front. Um, that, you know, it's a little bit more manual, but if you are not using a system to do it, it really kind of rolls out as if you're working with like a creative strategist at an agency. Alexandra, do you have any um, commentary to add there? Do you think that's accurate? That, that is completely accurate. I would say before you move forward with anything, definitely get that contract written. Hop on a phone call and talk to whoever you're partnering with about expectations, what you're looking for everything and just be as clear as humanly possible. Great. As Kearns, do you, um, is that helpful? Do you have other a question in that same vein or are there other questions that came in? Yeah, absolutely. So I think for maybe earlier stage brands who maybe don't have the same resources that other brands have uh, or a marketing budget that other brands have, it'd be great to talk a little bit more about other ways of engaging outside of, of uh, a more formal contract relationship. Sure. So, I mean, I think if you're engaging outside of a contract, you just, you have to know what you're getting into. And that is that you're really rolling the dice. There's not any, you know, agreed upon deliverable. Um, there's not a way for you to guarantee that the person is going to create content or, or post on your behalf. Um, you know, some brands do um, try and send out a product in advance um, of a launch and see what the, can come of it. I would, I would say that the investment of time energy in doing that versus, you know, finding one or two influencers that you can work with that you trust. Um, I, I would go the route of finding one or two people that you can trust. You don't have to launch a huge campaign, but if the budget is limited, at least start with one or two um, great people that you think bring a lot of authenticity to your brand and engage in a real partnership. I agree with Jenny on this. I think you run the risk when you reach out to an influencer and expect free engagement in exchange for pre sorry, in exchange for pre-product of sort of like rubbing people the wrong way. Um, for a lot of people, me included, like this is a full-time job. Years of education have gone into this, years of building a community, and you want to make sure that you're respectful of that. That being said, if you are a new brand, if you can't if you don't think that you can afford to run this whole campaign and you really are at a place where you only have product to give, um, it's a great way to build a relationship without any expectation. Um, just getting your product out there, it may pop up in a feed, it may not, um, but just getting people trying it, I think is positive. Great. So a lot of the ROI um, can be difficult the exact ROI can be difficult to be measured. Um, so are there other benefits to using an influencer or uh, there clearly are, but how would you weight the um, actual conversion to sales versus the reach or other metrics um, that, that working with an influencer can bring? Yeah, and I, I can actually jump in here with a, a little POV uh, mark some natively. Um, you know, I, I think that most brands, especially when they're starting off and budgets are tighter, 
always going to lean towards an ROI, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you need to ship product to keep your business going. I do think, though, that, that you know, sometimes there's an overcorrection there. And while driving ROI is always going to be very important, you know, marketing takes time. And we've seen this from smaller brands all the way up to, you know, the General Mills and, the, you know, the Nestle's of the world where people are leveraging, brands are leveraging influencers in two ways. Obviously, to increase awareness and drive, and, and, and drive sales, especially with the new tools that Instagram provides. But it's also important to sort of communicate the message and what your brand's about. And Instagram and influencers provide a tremendous way to do that. Um, a trend we've seen from, you know, like I mentioned, huge brands down to small is actually relying on influencers to help create the content or the creative that brands are producing to sort of showcase their products or what they're about. Um, you know, many times we're finding there, there's a lot of cost savings associated with that as well, where big brands are like, you know, we're seeing influencers because they're so creative and authentic, uh, produce creative that is much more cost efficient than what a, you know, a creative agency could do. Um, and much more, you know, impactful. Um, so they use it in terms of not only advertising, but especially now in a climate where you, you know, you can touch that consumer to, to purchase something, but you also have to keep that conversation going. Um, so we like to apply sort of a two to one methodology there where, you know, add some value to that consumer twice with the post where you're like, you know, oh, wow, I'm glad Alexandra just posted of her trip to uh, Rhone in France. That's an amazing picture. You should follow her at Tula Alexandra, by the way, amazing pictures, cute baby. Um, and, you know, like, I'm um, really, I want I wanted to take a trip to France, and wow, that's a great spot. Oh, that's great that that brand is integrated there. And then, you know, maybe in the, you know, there's another one of her trip. And then another one, it's sort of like, hey, there's a new product out. I really enjoy it as a snack when I go on a hike. Um, you know, I, consumers are smart. And if you're just trying to push them to sell, to buy, um, they're going to tune out. So, so, you know, sorry for the, going on the long-winded explanation there, but, but I think it's important to realize that, yes, this can be an ROI thing, but it could also be a way to, to get in, in a relationship where you're adding value to the consumer. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Influencer marketing and placement is extremely saturated. How does a brand stand out from the crowd and measure its success? So I think uh, similar to what what Mark just said, um, there's there's a couple of different ways that you can measure measure the success. And so what if you're really going for a conversion campaign, then set yourself up to actually see you if you're driving sales, whether it's traffic to a site, whether it's link, you know, downloading an app, um, whether there's something that people can use as like a promo code in the caption, then they go to your site and they can sign up for your service and get a discount for the first month or whatnot. Um, there's different ways to set up conversion campaigns so that you know you're measuring exactly whether or not there, there's impact here. Um, I think also at the end of the day, whether it's influencer marketing or whether it's advertising in general, naturally when people see things online, um, hard to believe it, but we actually do still do stuff offline. And so there is offline attribution that is never going to be able to be fully measured. Um, we have had some brands get creative with influencer posts in certain parts of the country and then measure in-store attribution um, for their specific brand at the grocery stores in that specific area, like upstate New York, so Kind of Ours was the brand we worked with. Um, and they actually did see increased traction in those stores. So even though it's really hard um, to measure, like they spent a year trying to figure out um, whether or not there was a way to map online um, to some, some offline attribution, um, and they were able to make a, a, a small correlation, which is pretty interesting. So there are definitely ways that are kind of like hard and fast ROI, um, but as Mark mentioned, there's, there's those kind of that softer ROI and that softer success as well. So if a brand is launching a new website, you're launching your, your Instagram channel, you're launching your Pinterest channel, you're launching your Facebook page, you're starting to place digital buys across specific properties that fit into your, your niche audience, um, the number one thing that you need to do that effectively is really good content. And for brands that are up and coming, engaging a creative agency and the long lead times that can be associated with that and the high cost of creative concepting and content production is often really prohibitive. Um, so a good way to measure success is if you're engaging influencers to help build your content story 
and your content strategy as well, measure the performance of that content. Um, have you know your internal team spin up a few pieces of content and, and A/B test it against each other. So there are ways, even though um, you know it is a saturated industry, yes, it can be tough to stand out. There's ways to figure out if that organic post and the content itself is performing really well, and then work you know take what's working and expand on it. You know, put more budget behind certain channels that are working best for you with influencer posts. Put more budget behind that ten, you know, ten pieces of content that you got that are just doing really, really well. Um, and that, you know, that's a way for you to really measure the success of whether or not this partnership, you know, created some ROI for you, whether it's sales or whether it's actual awareness through really, really good content and a strong content strategy. Yeah, and I, I think another point to bring up there, and again, taking sort of the the the, the brand and agency side of it, I think what one of the the things that Pop Pace does really well is that it allows the brands to see a wider swath of influencers. Because I think that's a great point. It can, can get a little repetitive and you see sort of the same influencers doing the same things for a subset of brands. Uh, part of the magic of Pop Pays is that you get exposed to a lot more influencers. Um, you'd be surprised by how many huge companies, you know, when I ask them like, yeah, how do you guys go about finding your influencers? And they're like, oh, we got an Excel sheet of 50 of them. And we just use those ones again and again. And it's like, these are, you know, publicly traded companies. And you're like, really? That's it? And they're like, oh, yeah. Or we just kind of like look around the internet and find them. Um, so, you know, as small business owners and you know, companies on the rise, I know your time's limited. Um, so pop base can be really helpful in sort of like, you know, opening you up to a wider swath of influencers. And the best part about the platform, the way it works, and maybe we have time for a little demo of that, is the ability to, they're the ones raising the hands being they, the influencers, whether they want to work with you or not. So they're almost self-selecting in a way of like, yeah, that brand or the brief aligns with who I am. And I think, you know, the, the marriage of like, there's a real appetite for them to work with you and say like, I'm interested in this rather than you reaching out to that Excel list of 30 people is, is a really, is a really unique thing that, that, you know, you wouldn't know unless you're sort of in the ins and outs of this every day. So, you know, it just makes, it's more impactful for your, for your valuable time. Mm -hmm. It's one more thing I'd point out there, and as Linda Dross, you probably have a strong point of view on this as well. As far as standing out, um, I would let the, the influencer help you stand out. They, they as I said, professionals, they can build amazing content. They're creative, they're living on social. Um, they're doing this, I know, full, in many cases, full time. And so they are going to have unique and interesting out-of-the-box ways to bring your brand to life, things that your team maybe not wouldn't have thought of. It's kind of like when you get a team in a room and you kind of get in the weeds, you can forget some of the great ideas that kind of float outside of that conversation. And influencers really bring new, fresh ideas and perspectives into it. Um, Alexander Dawson, I don't know if you want to expand on that a bit, but I definitely think, you know, let them, let them be creative because that's what they do. I totally agree with that. And also just to quickly touch back on the ROI perspective, um, a lot of times having an influencer create the content personifies your brand. Um, they're able to incorporate it seamlessly into like the lifestyle that they've created that the tens of thousands of people are following um, so that that community can envision your product in their life too, um, which in itself is a pretty incredible thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's a larger point there just in general media landscape as well, not to wax too philosophical here, but, you know, as media has become more fragmented and audiences have become more fragmented, we see like in popular culture, like Louis CK, when he gets to produce and write for his particular audience, that resonates that much more. Um, you know, there's more niche audiences, people are following more. So the same here, we've seen, you know, many cases where, again, the big brand will try to think they're back in the, in the old ages where we're producing an ad for 50 million people and it's got to resonate with everyone. And when you go too wide, you try to resonate with everyone. You don't resonate with anyone. Um, I just made that up. So not completely true, but, you know, I think part of it's true. Um, so I think that, you know, if you allow it, to do what they do best and they know their audience, you know, they're like, listen, if I hike up this mountain and like say like, man, this bar is the best thing I've ever had. I've never hiked so far. That's going to come off as really inauthentic. Don't make me do that. But if I say like, you know, I just kind of have my kid playing with it and say like, this is one of our favorite cars that we take, you know, 
So, so I think it's, it's really, you know, the word authentic gets overused too much in advertising, which is, is kind of uh, yeah, ironic, right? Um, but it, it, it does mean, I think, particular in influencer marketing, let them be a participant in, in what you're trying to, trying, to, trying to, the message you're trying to get across. I completely agree with that. I think in terms of my community, a lot of people follow because I am a real person. Not to throw in the word catfish, but you know, being recognized around the street, I think all over the country is probably one of the biggest compliments that I could ever receive. The fact that I'm portraying myself online exactly as I am and exactly as you will catch me, no matter where I am and what I'm doing. And I think that you will find a successful influencer and someone that can do that. Um, and a community can read that. I mean, there are real people that are really watching, and I think they can see between the lines. Um, so just creating an authentic experience, not to also use that word, but just a real life experience, somehow figuring out how to get real life on a screen. Great, thank you. So there are a couple of questions that have come in live, um, and, and I think we've touched on them, but maybe just to really focus in on, on this point, um, someone asked, do you recommend creating one specific influencer package to hand out to any potential influencer or to work with every influencer uniquely? I think we, we touch on this quite a bit in, in terms of allowing the influencer to, to target their audience in, in the most authentic way that they know how. Um, but in order to scale and to work with multiple influencers, how do you recommend um, creating the package for, for one and then to share to across multiple? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, Jenny, you can uh, expand on this, but I think that's one of the, the beauties of the PopPays platform. Um, not, not trying to shamelessly plug here, but, you know, when you create a brief, um, the cool part is, is that goes out to everyone within the network who has, you know, and in real time with the PopPays app. So, you know, you may only end up selecting one person that you feel fits the, the, the direction or the campaign, or you might get 10 and you might say, well, we'll use two now and then we'll kind of start developing a relationship with these eight others. So I think there, there's the ability to quickly scale that, but there's a flexibility to go on a one by one or sort of more niche basis to start off with, but you're not sort of recreating that work again and again. You know, the tradition, you know, if you're using the Excel list, you know, that's not, you're not getting the, the, the sort of efficiency there. What's great about the PopPays platform as well is that you can actually message um, that person within, you know, the, the, the PopPays dashboard environment. Everything's contained within there that you need. So you're not sending 18 different emails and then sort of like, you know, developing this workflow for, for you know, a bunch of different people. It's all sort of contained within there, and and that's pop plays at its core is a technology to to make this process more seamless. Yeah, I would say as far as working with different influencers in different ways, um, it's it's up to you. And you can take a an approach where hey, we have a pretty specific type of thing that we want to promote, um, whether it's a product, a package of products, and we want to work with a certain you know type of person and one of the things we cautioned that earlier is you'll be open to what quote unquote type of influencer that you want to work with because you never know who could bring your brand to life um but uh, the smart thing to do i think is you have a set of products or a package of products that maybe you're pushing out as a new launch um look at the different influencers you can work with and think about different ways they can bring your brand to life so you know, the, you know, a mom on the East Coast, quite different than like maybe a, a single woman on the West Coast. Like they can definitely bring your brand to, to life in different ways. So you don't want to prescribe one approach if you're going to be working with different types of people. Great. So this is, um, t touches on popular pays as, as, a, as a great tool, but what other tools are there to find quality influencers without going through an agency or keeping the process as internal as possible? Yeah, so there's, I mean, you can definitely use the networks themselves. So there's searchability there. Um, obviously, it's quite a bit of legwork if you're looking to track people down. Um, but the, the best way I've seen brands who are kind of starting out, dipping their toe in the water, maybe find a few initial partners or, or see if there are partners out there that they think will fit them, is they just use the networks directly um, to, to search. 
Great. Yeah, and I, I, the question just came in, what is the app or platform you keep referring to? Um, I, I think Pock Phase is pretty cool. Um, sounds like a mumblecore rapper. But um, I, uh, it's popular, as in I'm, uh, I was not popular in high school. Uh, Pays is in uh, P-A-Y-S, so popular it's Pays. Pop <laughs> it's popular, as in Mark was not popular in high school, Pays. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so with the last few minutes, maybe it makes sense then, it sounds like there's some interest in, in learning more about popular Pays. Uh, maybe we walk through the, the rest of the, the deck, Jenny, and um, just sure. the higher level what is popular pays and how can people get started? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things in the deck that we have as well, um, we did include some case studies, so you guys can dig into those a bit after um, the call. One case study I'll point out is the very last one is Harry's Razor. So we actually worked with them for three and a half years. So they started as, you know, a small brand. Um, and then last year we worked with them on their launch for Target, which was really exciting. So have worked with a lot of up-and-coming brands as they've, you know, kind of made their way and, and grown really quickly. It's definitely a, one of the biggest benefits of the, of the job for sure. Um, the way our, our platform works is it is a way to automate the uh, process of partnering with influencers without kind of removing the human element of that creative partnership. So what we, um, what we start with is a creative brief, and so you can actually create um, a brief in partnership with us. That brief goes live out to our network, and then influencers are bidding on that particular brief. Um, so if you are asking for four pieces of content and one post, they're bidding based on the creative ask. Is it um, a more simple setup, like perhaps it is really just shooting a product, um, or is it more a prop styling and there's a little bit more excessive production? Obviously, their rates are going to fluctuate based on the level of the ask. Um, so the brief displays out to our app that it's high. we have right now actually 13,000 creators on the platform, but truly we have uh, a small, like a smaller community of people who are highly engaged and who are high quality. A lot of platforms out there will tell you they have 50,000 people and it really just doesn't matter. What really matters is do you have quality partnerships? Is your product serving both sides of the market in a, in a positive way, which I, I believe ours does. Um, and Alexandra Dawson has used us in the past, and so she can speak some of her experience there as well. But once the um, campaign goes live, actually you can do everything from selecting the influencers that you want to work with, all the way through to shipping product, um, reviewing their content in the platform, and then tracking their posts as they go live. So here's a quick snapshot um, of the review, quote unquote, review applications tab. Um, this particular tab allows you to review um, both of the influencers' um, most recent posts, but also their application um, in general. So if Alexander is applying to the campaign, she's also inputting like a creative pitch and telling you, here's how I'm going to bring your brand to life. Here's what my feed is like. Here's what my approach to this would be like. Here's why it's important. So you're having a little bit of a creative conversation um, up front or seeing how they're thinking about your product. And then as you go through the platform, you can actually, if you flip to apply to the next one, um, you can actually track all of the progress of anyone that you're working with. So there's a state of page here that really we call kind of a quote unquote report card. And that report card allows us to, allows you to say who's uploaded on time, um, who's behind, and who has, who has upload on content and revision, who's posted. So it's a really easy way just to kind of keep track of the status. And that little talk box there that you see as well as a way to message directly. So one of the things we want to be, we really stand for is not, not getting in the way of that creative conversation. We want everyone to be able to connect directly with influencers and have that creative discussion. And we always encourage our brands to be actively engaging with uh, the influencers that they've chosen to partner with. I think there might be one, one more slide. So you can actually also, as I mentioned, review all content and captions directly in the dashboard. So if I'm working with you as an influencer, I'm uploading my photo, I'm uploading my caption, and you are accepting um, that photo, or you're requesting edits if that photo came in and perhaps it's a little bit off brief, um, or it needs a few small tweaks. So, um, you know, kind of, it seems very simple because it is. It's really end-to-end -end management of the process so that you can actually focus on the, the real important aspect of the partnership, which is that collaboration, both the creative collaboration um, and really building that partnership and relationship with influencers. 
Yeah, and sorry. And one, and one other thing, Jenny, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but you know, not only do you get then the influencer to post that to their feed and reach their followers, but then you know you also get additional content and the ability to sort of sub-license that particular image or video, um, you know, to put on your website or potentially use it in a number of different ways for your own other marketing collateral, which we've seen brands increasingly do. And I think just you know increases sort of the, the ROI on a more holistic basis on, on running these programs. Great. Oh, I think we can send some info out, out after the call. I'll turn I'll leave that to you as well. If there's people who want, um, you know, to dig a little bit deeper, but um, that's kind of the, the high level version of it. Great. Yes, absolutely. So we will make the both this recording as well as the presentation that we walk through available to all participants. Um, but I'd like just like to to thank Jenny uh, from Popular Pays very much for for your insights. Extremely valuable. Um, and Mark and his team at Natively really appreciate all of the the valuable input that everyone had in making this possible. And um, there were some questions that uh, we didn't quite get to, but we will follow up via email to cover everyone's question and questions. And please feel free to email us any additional questions that you might have. Um, and we look forward to additional topics in the future. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Alex Kranz, you've been awesome. Appreciate you um, helping us get this going. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Alexandra. We really appreciate the influencer perspective. Extremely helpful. Of course. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.